Well, good afternoon. We're going to do something a little bit different today, uh, especially here at the midterm of the semester. And so now that you've worked through three papers uh, for the semester and you're starting to think about working on the midterm assignment, this is the point at which I like to pause and kind of go back in the same way that we are in the midterm where you're looking back at the first half of the semester and to talk about some grammatical issues and style issues that you've seen me correcting in the course of the three papers uh, that we've done or that we've been working on. Um, but maybe you've been wondering, you know, what some of the errors are or how to correct them, you know, and I try to go through your papers and give you suggestions on how to make the corrections and how to, how to improve some of the stylistic issues. Um, but I'm going to uh, go through just some basic things uh, that are the most common challenges, I would say, in English 101. Uh, and these are the sort of issues that come up, particularly in the first half of the semester, you know, as we're working through the papers and going through week to week and working on these different assignments. What I'm going to show you today are some of the most common issues that come up. And uh, these are ones that, again, may be or in some of the papers that you've written. They're very common mistakes. If you make them um, with a couple of exceptions, it's not a big issue. There, there is one in particular on here that is a challenge and a, and a very big issue, which I'll start with. Uh, but the other ones are smaller errors that are very easy to correct. Uh, you can either have me look over your paper, you can get an appointment with one of the, uh, the writing tutors at our writing center at Harper online, or you know, if you, if you do have a friend or a family member that maybe could help you take a look at an essay before you turn it in, uh, that's sometimes another good opportunity to get another set of eyes on the paper. Okay, so I'm going to do the screen share, you know, here using Zoom, and uh, I'm going to go through these briefly. I'll also post this list uh, of uh, corrections on uh, Blackboard, again, especially since now you've got these three papers under your belt, you're, you're thinking about the midterm. And so this is a good time to kind of look back at some of these stylistic issues as we look forward to the second half of the semester and the papers that we're gonna be doing uh, in that second half of the term. So let me do my screen share here. And like I said, I'll go through each one of these briefly. Uh, any of these sentence errors that I, I have on here on this, this sheet uh, are also corrected. So let me kind of go through them one by one. And you'll notice some of them are really not even stylistic errors specifically, but they're issues that come up, which if you address them, are again easy to fix and will make a lot of the other aspects of, of the, the papers uh, a lot uh, stronger and more effective. So first things first, and I've mentioned this before, I've touched on it in other videos, particularly of the last two papers, but I really want to stress this. And this is not just for our class, but also for any class that you'll be taking in college, whether it's here at Harper or uh, you know wherever you, you choose to go to after when you're transferring, your, you know, if you're finishing your bachelor's degree um, somewhere else. This is, a, this is applicable everywhere, and that is this point. Do not use any outside sources without citing them properly. If you do that, so if you're writing your paper and you go online or, uh, and you start cutting in and splicing things from websites and you don't cite them, that's an F. It's an automatic F for the paper. Uh, it can be an F for the course, particularly if, if you, you do that persistently. Uh, and it's a matter of honesty. These papers are your papers. Uh, when I read them, I'm interested in your thoughts, in your opinions, and hopefully you've seen that as we've been going through the first half of the semester. I'm interested in what you have to say about these readings and hearing your stories as you write about them. So I'm not interested in reading something that was pieced together from online sources uh, and then was passed off as your own work. It's dishonest to do that on a very fundamental level. Um, it, it's not ethical, it's not honest, and it's, it's not something um, that will serve you well at all because again, the consequences of it can be really severe and it's better to turn in a paper that's yours, that you worked on, even if it's flawed and has challenges because again, we will get to a revision assignment later in the semester after we get past the midterm. Uh, so the work that you turn in should be your work. And if you do have any sources in the work that you're doing, they have to be cited and they have to be cited correctly. So here's an example. And I, I, I get uh, paragraphs like this sometimes uh, in papers, particularly early on in 101, where a student will try to supplement their ideas uh, by taking material from, again, an online source and then not citing it. So here's an example paragraph uh, or short or a couple sentences, I should say, that I want to read for you. Uh, about Evelyn Glennie. And this was not taken from any of the papers this semester, so I, you know, I, I, I didn't pull this out from any, but this is based on uh, this problem that I've seen in, in essays. Uh, and I see it 
thankfully not terribly frequently, but it's enough that again, it's something that we, you know, we do want to address, particularly uh, as you finish this class and think about going into English 102 perhaps in the spring. So here's the, here's the sample sentences. Evelyn Glennie is a well-known Scottish musician who reflects on her feelings about music in hearing essay. And that's fine. There, there's, that's, that's just a statement uh, that the writer's making. But the second half where it says where she is a drummer and composer who lost nearly all of her hearing by age 12, the hearing didn't, hearing loss didn't isolate her but gave her a unique sensitivity and connection to music. That sentence is taken from, and I'll go to my browser here and show you, that last sentence was taken from here. Percussionist and composer Evelyn Glennie lost nearly all of her hearing by age 12. Rather than isolating her, it has given her a unique sensitivity and connection to her music. And this is from an NPR uh, article about Evelyn Glennie uh, that talks about how she records music and performs music. So that's an example of plagiarism. That could be the only line in the paper uh, that ha that is taken from another source. But if it's in there, I'm going to have to give it an F. It's it's just part of the process. Again, it would have to be cited. So if you were going to use that information, I won't go in and correct this now. You would have to then quote directly from the article. So you'd have to say, according to NPR, the National Public Radio, uh, Glenny is and then again this person tried to modify it even if you modify it it's still material taken from another source and that's called a paraphrase now in this case it's not even changed that much so what would have to happen is and again i won't retype really the whole sentence here that would have to be in quotation marks you'd have to indicate where it came from and if you did that you indicated where it came from and you also put that in your work cited i'm not going to give you enough for the paper because that means you're showing where the source came from and you're identifying it and you're showing the reader of your paper, who's me, that this is a little more research that you did. Now, as you've noticed, I very specifically for all the papers we've done mentioned whether or not you need to use sources, right? And at this point, we've only been using the readings for the class. So um, don't do it. I mean, again, I could, I could lecture you for a couple of hours on this and why it's not a good thing to do and why you can get into a lot of trouble for it. Um, but at, at a very basic, simple level, just don't do it because it makes a lot of trouble, not only for you, but also for me, because then I've got to track it down and I've got to then come back to you with the F and explain to you what's happened. And uh, it's a serious issue, especially with writing. So one of the things you should absolutely never do when you're starting to write a paper uh, is to immediately go online and then start looking for information about this particular source. When you're doing research papers, especially in 102, you'll have a very structured system uh, that you'll have to follow in terms of doing research. So if you're writing about somebody like Lenny, again, your, your first impulse should not be to go to your browser, not even to read the article and look up some material on Evelyn Glennie. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, one, one more before we kind of move on from this topic. Um, over the years with the Mike Rose essay, I've had people plagiarize. And, and the reason for that is that that Mike Rose essay, as you'll notice here, when I type it into my browser, it comes up almost immediately because there's all of these summaries and analyses. And you'll notice I even have two clicked on here, which means at some point on this computer, I probably had someone plagiarized from these websites and I had to track them down. So these sites are not gonna help you. They're not academically uh, significant. They're not academic at all. They're cheating websites. So don't use them, write your own papers. If you're struggling, just ask me for help. Now you can either email me, we can do an online Zoom session if you want to. I am always happy to help. And hopefully you've seen that in, in the way that I get the papers back to you with my comments and the way that I respond to you. So I'm always happy to help. So there's no reason to plagiarize anything. Okay, so that's the first rule. Uh, and again, it's not even a grammar rule, but just to do how to, how to do better on your papers, don't do that. Okay, so now the second thing, and I've said this uh, from the very beginning of the semester, but this will save you a lot of trouble in your life, not just in, in college or uh, uh, in, uh, in school, but in the workplace and uh, maybe even in your, in your home life as well. Read the directions. Don't start writing a paper until you have read the readings that are associated with it. You know, in the case of the midterm, what we're doing now, that would mean those poems uh, that I have posted up on Blackboard, and make sure you've read the directions. So the first thing you should do, I said, I said in the last point, what you shouldn't do when you start a paper, but the first thing you should absolutely do when you know a paper has been assigned is go into Blackboard. I'm just going to pick one of my sections here of my four English 101 classes. You're all doing the same work, just on a different schedule. So I'm just going to click on, let's say I was in English 101 section 15. So I click on that and the first thing that you should always do when you know that a paper is coming up is go to readings, quizzes, and writing assignments, 
and take a look at the directions. You know, look at the directions themselves, uh, read through them, go through all the details on it, look for the videos. Again, those are always under the announcement sections. The videos often have, you know, the outlines on them, but that should be the first thing that you do. That way, you'll have a sense of what I'm asking for. I think by now you've probably noticed that with my directions, um, sometimes they're even too long. I try to map everything out as, as much as I can. And again, the reason for that is, as I've said, for me as an undergraduate, I liked having detailed directions. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to, to follow every part of the directions to the letter because sometimes you might be working on a topic and you might be modifying your ideas for it or coming up with your own opinion on it. But all, everything you're going to need to know is on those directions. So please make sure you read them over. And again, if you remember nothing else from this class, if you can come away with it knowing not to plagiarize and also to read your directions carefully and to reach out for help when you need it, those those lessons will serve you well in anything else that you do when you're a college student and maybe even when you're out of college, all right? So read those directions. And then as soon as you see a part of the directions you don't understand, email me. And the same thing goes for the second half of the semester because the directions are going to look the same. We're going to be working on these papers every two weeks with some additional quizzes like we did in the first half. Um, so same schedule, all right? So those two things I think are the most important points I want to make at this midpoint of the semester. The rest of these are going to be more grammatical issues, more specifically sentence level issues that you've probably seen me correct. So I wanted to make sure I talked about them. And again, I do the same thing for in-person classes. If we were in, in the classroom right now with each other and not online, I'd be giving you the same lecture uh, in the classroom. <laughs> All right, so uh, next thing, quotation marks. Some of you have asked me about this. With quotation marks and italics, very, very simple. First off, any short works are always placed in quotation marks. So the titles of short works are in quotation marks. Those are things like essay titles, poem titles, the titles of short stories, or uh, um, articles in newspapers and magazines, song titles are always in quotation marks, uh, whereas italics are, are used for longer works, right? So that would be movie titles, TV show titles, novel titles, newspaper magazine titles, uh, website names, uh, when you're putting them into your work cited, those are all longer pieces. I had a student last year who said that the way he, she remembered this was that longer works make things tilt over. So she, she thought of italics as indicating something that's longer, like, you know, again, a full length book, you know, so a full length book and, and the title of a full length book is going to be italicized because it's a longer, heavier work. I like that. I thought that was a good way to remember it. Um, so in this particular case, let me give you a sem sample sentence. Uh, I have a couple of sample sentences here, right? So you'll notice I have this first one is talking about one of my favorite albums, 5150 by Van Halen, a whole album or mixtape, I guess maybe you, <laughs> you younger folks would call it now, is a longer work. So th this is talking about my favorite song from this favorite album of mine, my favorite track from Van Halen's 1986 album, 5150. Notice again, that's the name of the album, so it's in italics, is the song Best of Both Worlds. So the quotation marks are around the title of the song, because again, it's a short work. It's a three and a half minute song. One other thing you want to notice here, and I'll go through the second example, uh, second couple of examples here in a minute. Uh, you'll notice I'm putting in these italics in places where I forgot them so you can kind of see how to do it. In American English, we put periods and commas inside quotation marks. So a couple of you had emailed and said, oh, you know, I noticed that you're correcting the placement of these periods and commas. And the reason for that is, again, in American English, that's where they're placed. So we don't, uh, in, in US English, we don't put periods outside quotation marks. If you were ever taught that, it's not correct for American usage. Now, if we were in the UK right now, and a couple of you had emailed and, and mentioned this to me, in the UK, for example, in England, in any, any part of the world that is has a, an educational system based on the British system, they do it in the opposite. So if we were in the UK right now, if we were writing this in England, um, or in uh, maybe even in Ireland. I don't know if Ireland follows the UK system, at least the Republic of Ireland, where all my, a lot of my family's from. Um, it would probably look like this. So they use single quotation marks and they put periods outside. Now, why is that? It's just conventional usage in different parts of the world. But in our case, again, it's inside, period goes inside the quotation marks, and those are the double quotation marks. You'll also notice, notice with titles that all the major words that have to be capitalized, Prepositions like of do not, they're, they're lowercase, but anything that's like this, like best, both in worlds, 
every one of those words has to be capitalized in a title. Uh, I'll give you, I'll skip over the second one uh, on Jamila Woods because it's very similar to the first sentence here and you can read these over on Blackboard. Here's another one that would, be, would have been relevant for those of you maybe that were taking photographs for paper number two to write about from, you know, a newspaper or magazine source. It says here, I read several articles from the New York Times. New York Times is a newspaper, so it's italicized uh, to research this paper. I learned a lot from an article called What's Nostalgia Good For? written by John Tierney. So again, the article is What's Nostalgia Good For? We may actually read that in the second half of the semester. I sometimes use that article in the second half of 101. Uh, and the New York Times, which is a newspaper, both online and in print. And so it's a longer work and it's in italics, okay? So those are your basic rules. There's really no exceptions to this. Particularly in MLA format, that's how you indicate the punctuation of titles. So we don't underline anything. Uh, we don't use bold lettering for titles in, in this kind of MLA formatting. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. Next up, run-ons and sentence fragments. These I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, I've corrected these when I see them in your papers. Remember, a run-on sentence technically is not a sentence at all. When I was learning my grammar stuff in high school, we called it a comma fault. And that means you've pieced together multiple sentences that should be separate, separated by periods or by semicolons, but you've put them all together into one statement. And when that happens, it makes for some awkward reading. And let me give you an example of that. So here's a sample that's a long run on. When I read Susan Sontag's essay on photography, I realized that I take too many pictures while I'm on vacation. I take these pictures because I want to remember the trip. My mom also thinks I take too many photos and the Sontag suggests I know I should take time to enjoy the moment itself. You're, running, you're gonna run out of breath with, it, with something like that. That's not a complete sentence. It's actually multiple sentences that have all been kind of squashed together. Typically in 101, I see that in papers maybe that were maybe a little bit rushed, you know, where you, maybe you didn't have time to go back to really edit them and look at them carefully. Uh, it can also happen if you're writing quickly and you're not making a distinction between your writing voice and your speaking voice. We all speak differently than we write. So writing and putting words down on paper or on your computer is very different of a process than texting or sending somebody an informal email or just speaking something out. And so you wanna make that distinction. The reader has to be able to navigate your sentences. So the more pauses you can put in with periods and commas, the more they're gonna be able to absorb the information that you're trying to express to them. So let me show you the correction for this. And it's a basic correction. I should also mention when you're correcting fragments, which are incomplete sentences as we'll, as we'll see next, and run-ons, that there's multiple ways to correct them. Uh, and again, everyone has a different writing style. So there's no one way to correct any, any error like this. Um, so that's also something to keep in mind. So what I'm gonna show you next here is a very basic correction that does the job and separates the ideas into, into multiple sentences. So here it is. When I read Susan Sontag's, or when I read Susan Sontag's essay on photography, I realized that I take too many pictures while I'm on vacation. I take these photos because I want to remember the trip. However, my mom also thinks I take too many photos. As Sontag suggests, I know I should take time to enjoy the moment itself. So you'll notice, even as I read that, the periods distinguish the different ideas that are in each one of those sentences. And they give a pause, not just for you as the writer, but also for the reader. So the reader can then read each one of these pieces slowly and then absorb the information that you're giving to them. And that's the whole point of using punctuation marks is to, is to basically to control the way in which the person who is reading your work is reading it. So you control the message that you're sending to them and you're doing that through these subtle little shifts in punctuation. I always think of writing as being very musical, uh, probably because you know I, I, I'm also a musician, but I, I like to hear the rhythms of the sentences and I like to think about how those rhythms or the kind of the music of the sentences and their pacing uh, affects the reader. So that's what, where punctuation is there to help you convey those ideas, to convey those opinions, to convey those emotions to the reader. And so again, we all might have a different way of approaching this correction, but that does the job. So that's a correct set of sentences. Now, I'll sometimes have students who say, oh, those sentences seem so short. Uh, they're so concise. Sometimes concise is exactly what you want. And I think you're gonna find that in whatever profession, most of the professions that you guys are gonna go into are going to be ones in which you're gonna mostly have to write really compact, informative, uh, concise pieces of writing, whether it's letters or whether it's memos or whether it's reports that you have to write. 
it's, it's really a skill to be able to write concisely and effectively. Because again, the goal here is to communicate your ideas as effectively as possible to the reader. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Fragments are the opposite end of the spectrum because in a fragment, you have an incomplete sentence. It's usually one that lacks a, a subject or it lacks a verb. Sometimes it can lack both. And it results in things like this. And these are probably easier to identify. I notice that when I point these out, people are usually, students are usually able to correct these much more quickly because you can really hear the mistake here. First thing I do when I sit down to write a paper is to make an outline, an outline of my thoughts so that I can keep my essay organized. That second part's a fragment. The first part's complete, why? Because it says the first thing I do, so I and do here, right, for subject and verb. That's complete, but here, an outline of my thoughts so that I can, there's no subject there. So the way to correct that would be to do the following. The first thing I do when I sit down to write a paper is to make an outline. I make an outline of my thoughts so that I can keep my essay organized. You need that first person, you need the I in there because that's the subject of the sentence. You're the one making the outline. And so for the sentence to be complete, it needs the subject and the verb. Now, do some writers use sentence fragments for effect? Sure, they do, especially people that do creative nonfiction, you know, any kind of fictional writing, uh, poets. But that's a, that's a different kind of writing. So the writing that we're doing is, is sort of very fundamental. It's the foundation. You can't work on the attic of your house, as, I was, as, a, as a couple of you uh, were mentioning to me a few days ago. You can't, you can't build the, the upper floors of the house until you have the foundation. And that's my, Cody, who's in one of my classes, had also mentioned that a couple of days ago to, to me in a, in a little online session we were doing. And I agree with that statement because you can't really build the rest of the house until the foundation is there. So the idea of using sentence fragments is something you can eventually do, but you need to have that foundation first, and then you can experiment with the form. Uh, and that's the way to become a good writer. Learn those basic rules first, have confidence with them, because then later you can change the rules around, you can, you can uh, use them to your, for your own purposes when you're trying to express an idea to a, uh, to a reader, okay? So those are fragments. Again, they're pretty easy to correct. Um, these last few I'm gonna do much more quickly because they're just basic sort of final reminders. I is always used for subjects of sentences. So avoid doing something like this. Me and my sister loved going to our uh, Aunt Judy's house for Christmas. Me has to be used for objects, the, the second half of a sentence. If you had a sentence here that said, my Aunt Judy gave me a gift, me is used again for the object, the object of the sentence. Okay, it's that objective part of the sentence where something is being given to you. But the correct way to do this is to say, I, my sister and I uh, loved going to our Aunt Judy's house at Christmas. So, so I, because if you, the way to remember that is if you read the sentence as um, me loved going to Aunt Judy's house, that's not going to sound right, right? It sounds awkward, but I, loved going to Aunt Judy's house, it sounds correct, right? It, it, it sounds correct as you read it to yourself or as you hear it. So keep that in mind as well. Some grammatical rules are based on what sounds better and what reads better when uh, you're writing. I mean, there, it, long ago, someone came up with some of these rules because they realized that they worked, right? And so that's a good example for using I in, in sentences. So if you've seen me correcting that in the subject parts of your sentences, that's, that's why I was correcting it. Um, I've already mentioned to read over your final draft carefully, as carefully as you can. I know we're all very busy, especially under these current circumstances we're living in. These Again, it's a cliche to say these are unprecedented times, but they are, and you have to keep that in mind. But as best you can, if you can get some extra help, if you can read over that last draft of the paper and look for some of these errors, I think you're going to find that a lot of those issues are going to go away because by reading it over, especially if you're able to read your paper over after you've let it sit for at least a couple of hours, if not even a day, maybe let it sit, write the paper as early as you can, and then give yourself some distance from it. Um, that's my other bit of advice. Some folks have said, well, how can I do better? How can I improve? Don't put off the paper to the last minute. I always give my assignments two weeks ahead of time. So by the middle of the week after you get the assignment, you should have started on it. Don't wait to three days before the assignment because you know yourself, you've got family responsibilities, you've got work responsibilities, you have other classes. So to the best of your ability, my advice would be to start early and work up to the length of the paper, even if it just means you write one paragraph every day 
um, or two paragraphs every day, if you do that slowly, you're going to find that your papers are going to be stronger if you take your time. And taking your time doesn't mean that every day you've got to write a new draft of the paper and reinvent it. It might mean doing an outline one day. And then the next day you add a couple of paragraphs to your outline. And then the next day you add a couple more paragraphs until you have the whole paper. And at that point, you can have plenty of time to edit it, but take your time. So if you're in the habit uh, of procrastinating, of trying to do papers like the day before or the day of or, or two days before, I would recommend trying to break yourself of that habit. Now, I know I have friends that tell me, oh, I write better when I'm under a lot of stress and pressure. I guess I see that point for some people. That's never worked for me, so I don't advise doing it. I don't advise writing papers the day before, particularly as you get further into your college classes and you've got research papers that are going to be a lot longer than the ones you're writing here in English 101. So as best you can, if you can get this paper started earlier, just a little bit, try to avoid procrastination. That's, that's a huge challenge, and a lot of the mistakes and errors that come up are coming often out of that problem. You know, people are rushing, people not really taking their time. So something to keep in mind, not just for this class, but for any of your classes. Um, and that leads me to my final point for this video, which be, would be MLA citation format. So we're three papers into the course. We're gonna be doing another couple of papers after the midterm. So you'll notice every paper we've done thus far, with the exception of the first one, has had work cited. Okay, every paper you're gonna write in 102 will have a work cited. Uh, the last two papers, the last few papers we do for this class will have work cited. So here's the basics that you need to know now that you've, you've kind of worked on this over the last two essays. For this class, you're really reading either essays that were taken from a book source or you're reading essays that were taken from an electronic source. So in the case of hearing essay, let me just show you these two examples. Uh, in this case, in the middle of your paper, you would say something like this. Uh, she explains in hearing essay that in her opinion, hearing is basically a specialized form of touch. And you'll notice that it's an online source. There's no page numbers. Uh, and it's very rare that you're gonna get an online source like this that is going to have any page numbers. So in MLA format, Modern Language Association, which we use for English and literature and other humanities classes, all you have to do after the quotation is to put the last name of the author in parentheses. And you'll notice the period goes to the end of the sentence. That's the correct format for MLA formatting for online sources. And then at the end of the paper, you always have to have a work cited. Anytime you're citing anything, there's gotta be a work cited at the end of the paper after the final paragraph. It would look like this, pretty basic. Last name of the author, first name, the name of the article, the name of the website, which is italicized. Thanks you for a couple of you that checked on that. It is, it is italicized. If there is a date for the article, uh, then you put the date in. Not every website and every article on a website is going to have a date on it. So if it doesn't have it, you just leave that part out. In the case of Glenny, however, if we go to the website here, I probably should have just clicked on that link, you'll notice that the date is right here. So here's the name of her website, full name of it, the name of the article, and then the date that she posted it back in 2015. Okay. So after that, you put the, the URL, the web address. So that means that if someone wanted to read this article after reading your paper, they could link to it. That's the whole point of putting in a work cited. They could see the research that you did, then they could see where to find it themselves. And then the access date is there. I talked with a couple of you about this to show when you read it, because these are online sources. They might change, they might be modified in some way, they might disappear altogether. So you're indicating when you read it, which means that that was a date on which it was still active and it was still available to readers uh, online. And in this case, I just put today's date. Uh, as I'm filming this, because that's the last time I checked on it, just now actually, right? So that's that's an online source. That's a basic format for an online uh, reading, and this will also apply to the ones that we do in the second half of the semester. Now, if you're using a book source, like we did with Sontag, I took that article, that essay from a longer book of hers, uh, you do the following. Now, we also got some practice on this with paper number two. This is actually a sentence that's based on one of the readings we're going to do in the second half of the term. Uh, John Porcelino's perfect example, a memoir. And so here's a sample sentence. Just before he decides to go to NIU for college, the main character in perfect example says, I bet everyone in college listens to the band Husker Du. And that's a line you're going to see from that, that autobiographical book that we're going to read uh, in a few weeks. And in this case, you put the last name of the author and the page number. So if there is a page number on your source, if it's a book source, last name of the author, page number, that's all you need. No commas in it no P period, no date, nothing like that. For this format, it's the last name of the author and the page number. And again, the period comes at the end of the sentence. For the work cited, and this is gonna look a lot like Sontag, last name of the author, first name, 
the name of the book itself, which in, again is italicized because it's a book title, uh, the name of the publisher, in this case, his publisher is drawn in quarterly up in Canada, and then the, the year it was published. That's it. MLA is a pretty, pretty basic format. You're going to do even more work with that when you get into English 102. We'll do more of it in the second half of the semester of this term. Um, what I also recommend, and I believe I may have put this on the website for the class, if not, I highly recommend using the OWL, the Online Writing Lab at Purdue University. They have an overview of pretty much any citation format that you would have to use for any of your college classes. So let me show you an example. If I go to the main page here, I'm on the MLA part of it. Uh, this is free and open to the public. I've used this for years. I've used this for my own articles when I have to look up citation formats that I'm not really familiar with. Uh, so I use this website all the time. And you're going to notice on the, the uh, left-hand side of the page here, all these different guides. These are the most common three types of citation formats you would use in your college papers, okay? So if you take a look here, you've got the MLA guide, APA is more commonly used for social science, education, psychology in those classes. Those are, that's probably the format they would ask you to use. Uh, Chicago style is used more commonly in history. Um, uh, some, some, some social science classes, but again, I think of Chicago manual style as being more for history papers. Uh, maybe some social sciences that are more historical, but those are the three main formats that you're going to use for any paper. So this is a great website to use. Again, for us, we're using MLA. So the guide is here, uh, all these different types, all these different resources. So these are there for you to use. I know some students also use things like, uh, I think it's Citation Machine. That's not a bad site. Again, that's, that's a site that can help you uh, not only review the sources, but if you type in the source that you're using, It'll help you form the citations. This is a valid site to use. It is not a cheating site. It's not a plagiarism site. Uh, it's just a site to help you, um, as it says here, cite correctly and accurately. So it does have a lot of ads on it, which is not great, but which is why I tend to prefer using the, uh, um, the uh, OWL website. And I like the OWL website too, because it's like the old saying, you know, if you learn how to <laughs> teach a man teach a man how to fish and he'll learn and he'll be able to fish for the rest of his life right so learning how to actually do the the citations yourself uh is better because you'll remember it better than just using the automated uh, version on citation machine so i highly recommend going here looking at the website which also has some ads unfortunately but i guess that's how they pay for it uh and again everything you're going to need to know is here all right now again i want to show you an example of this uh here's a recent article and i'll do this real quick and then we'll wrap up this little video this is a recent article that i had to write uh that's appearing in the book that i have coming out in in the spring that i edited with a friend of mine and one of my articles is appearing so just to give you an example of why all this citation stuff is important and why it's valuable, this is an article that uh, you know my copy editor went through. You'll see it's laid out a little differently than your papers because when something's going out for publication, uh, this is the uh, these are codes that are used for designers when they're actually putting a publication together. Um, but I wanted to show you the work cited that I have for this because this was a good example where I had to modify how I was citing things because I'm used to MLA. But our publisher for this book, Louisiana State University Press, they wanted something that was kind of a combination of MLA sourcing and Chicago Manual style sourcing. So I had to look a lot of this up along with my co-editor to take what I already knew how to do, which is MLA, and then combine it with the Chicago style, right? And so a lot of this work cited here, and you'll see it's fairly long. Um, this was all something that I had to look up. And I show you this because it's not like in my brain I had memorized all these different citation formats for these different entries. And these are all the resources that I used in this, uh, it's like about a 20, 20 page, uh, 6,000 word article. Uh, where did I go to help me do this work cited? I went to that resource. Like I said, when I was reformatting this over the summer and, and in early September for, for the book source, I went to this website. I went to, as I showed you before, I was like, geez, I don't remember how to do um, that formatting for uh, Chicago manual style. So I went to the Purdue website. I went to the writing lab. Okay. And I looked down here and I said, okay, how do I do that particular format? I clicked on here and I went to Chicago style because our editor for the book said to us, we're going to use a version of Chicago style for your book. And so we need to have all the articles in the book, follow that format. So I had to give myself a crash course on this. Now, why do I mention all that you, to you? Well, I mention it because even someone like me who's been writing for a long time, enjoys writing, does the best, I do the best I can. 
I don't know every single rule for every grammatical problem, every single, every single citation method. You've got to use those resources. And we're lucky today that we have these electronic versions. You don't have to run to your shelf and get a manual necessarily to do those kinds of edits when you're citing something. And so I encourage you to use those resources. You know, in the second half of the semester, we're also going to be using the resources we have uh, on the Harper Library pages. So those are going to be really, really helpful. And I'll show you how to use those in another video after the midterm. Um, but again, these are all very common corrections and things that I wanted to reflect on a little bit here as, as we get ourselves into the midterm part of the semester. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. I apologize for the length of this video. <laughs> Again, um, maybe you can watch it in different pieces as you go along. I'll also post that those, those list of corrections up on, on Blackboard when I post this video. But please let me know if you have any questions. Again, I, I think that we're going to have a very exciting and I hope fun second half of the semester. We're going to read some great Chicago poets, some comics, uh, some graphic novel selections, uh, pieces of graphic novels. So we're going to have some interesting readings. And I would encourage you to, to just keep exploring. You're never done as a writer. I tell you this from experience. The, the more you write, the more you learn. And sometimes the more you write and the more you learn about writing, the more you realize, as another cliche goes, that you still have a lot more to learn. And I'm, I'm, I feel like that every day as a writer. I'm still learning new things. And that's what makes writing really exciting and really fun. It, it's, you don't reach one point and you say, okay, I'm done. I know everything now and I'm not going to develop. You keep learning and you'll find that as you get older and as you keep writing and as you keep developing your own voice as a writer, you're going to find that there's always new things to learn and there's always new, new ideas to explore, whether it's through citations or readings or uh, different writing styles or, or, or different ways of punctuating sentences. Uh, so I hope you have some fun with that, particularly as we get into the second half of the semester. Okay, so that's enough of my talking for, for this little video. Uh, I'll be back uh, in another video with some more suggestions on the midterm for right now. Here's, that's our little overview for this midpoint of the semester with grammatical stuff. See you later.